This is Proxy Countdown. Welcome to the big show for the week of January 8th, 2024. Alongside my tag team partner, Matt Muscardi. Woo! I'm Damian Rollis. On today's countdown, the Starbucks board is playing defense. A new Nepo baby director at Carrier Thank Global. God, yeah. An update at the, Dix- the Disney Proxy Cage match. On our vote results table, a bunch of confused shareholders at Ring Central. And finally, on the big vote at Beckton Dickinson, where the board likes to ignore shareholder votes. Ooh. Let's go to the trade wire. Our top story from our largest cap companies on Tuesday Starbucks increased its board size from 8 to 11 and appointed three new dude directors to its board. That's the that's Neil Mohan, the CEO of YouTube, Daniel Cervetje, the CEO of Grupo Bimbo, which is the international food brand responsible for Latin wonder bread called Bimbo Blanco, and Mike Siever, the CEO of T-Mobile. Remember back in October, Wei Zhang, previously of Alibaba Pictures Group, joined the board. So, Matt, we reported last month that a coalition of North American labor unions called the Strategic Organization Organizing Center had nominated three directors to the Starbucks board. That's uh, a former senior White House official, Maria Echeveste, ESG pro Joshua Gottbaum, and a former chair of the National Labor Relations Board, Wilmer Liebman. So isn't this just an extension of... Uh, union quashing. I mean, absolutely. You effectively expanded the size of the board because you can by charter, but they had already announced the slate, and they have to announce the slate months in advance of the proxy. They announced three directors, and at the time, Starbucks had what eleven directors. So you're effectively announcing just under a, a, th- a third of the board, between a third and a quarter of the board. And now, since then, Starbucks has somehow managed to increase the board such that you've diluted the value of the slate. Now, if you're an investor voting on this board, your incentive is to vote out the slate who has not been appointed, does not have access, is not mm-hmm. on the board, and vote for the directors that were appointed and then get already these, there. They're already there. They mm-hmm. get uh, they've signed contracts. This is just a, like a it's like a backdoor quash. Yeah, and it looks rushed in as well as if you look at who they selected, the CEO of T-Mobile, the CEO of YouTube for yeah. Starbucks. I mean, the CEO of YouTube makes some sense in that you can draw circles between existing board members like Satya Nadella and um, the 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 YouTube CEO. No idea we, how it benefits shareholders. We know at Starbucks. that they're connected. Yeah. It, it it does feel a little bit like we need to get somebody who looks qualified in here, who no one's going to argue with, and and who we can find in less than a month. And we can find in less Quickly. than a month a point. Yeah. Right. Get and, them on the board and, them, and running. Get them immediately yeah. on the board. So can you imagine being the um, the placement agent for that? The, that you just got I'd paid like a ton that. of money, probably within six weeks, to place board members just to quash an incoming slate. At Intel Corporation, Sandra Rivera has assumed the role of CEO of Programmable Solutions Group, that's PSG, an Intel standalone business. If PSG eventually IPOs, which they, they're saying it might, uh, Sandra has the potential to be the third ever Latina CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So that's for forward wishful thinking. The, wow. Okay. Some early <laughs> anticipatory wishful <laughs> thinking. Carrier Global added Maximilian Weissman to its board. Max is a Nepo baby. He is CEO of Weissman Group, a German heating company founded by his great grandfather. How many? So a Nepo baby, but uh, how many Maximilians do you think there are outside of Germany on boards? Uh, I, I looked at our our platform for flow analytics, I think about six or seven. Wow, that's more than I would have expected. <laughs> uh, McKesson Corporation has appointed former McDonald's CFO Kevin Ozon as a director. The connection between McDonald's and a healthcare company should be obvious. <laughs> And at Simon Property Group, Nina Jones appointed to the board. CEO and chair David Simon said, quote, she brings a unique perspective as a former institutional real estate investment professional, according to the company's latest proxy, this unique perspective is shared by nine other board members. <laughs> uh, 77% of the Simon property board is controlled by Simon family 
members, so her other unique perspective is likely to be the back of the driver's seat headrest. Oh, that does sound comfortable, though. Uh, let's move over to our proxy cage matches. Let's start with Disney, where there is nothing new. Oh. Uh, there are already three heavy-hitting activists involved with the Disney proxy cage match. We are still waiting for Bill Ackman to swoop in and scream DEI in a crowded theater while accusing the cast of Hamilton of being a bunch of talentless inclusion hires. Well, the, the, the one thing that's worth saying about Disney is uh, Disney diluted their board before Starbucks did. So the d- dilution space race is on. And they uh, increased the dividend that, payout. That, that's another way to grease the palms yes. of an investor. Also in the news, the Financial Times is reporting that activist investors mount a record number of attacks against companies last year. There were 252 new campaigns globally. That's up 7% from last year. More than 40% of activists launching campaigns did so for the first time. Uh, Universal proxy rules introduced in 2022, which guaranteed that all board nominees will appear on the company's ballot, have had little effect on the number of board seats won by activists. Also, 37% of campaigns that ended with a winning board seat, lasted more than 90 days, and 34% settled within one week. And finally, there has been a resurgence in multiple hedge funds swarming, this is the words of the FT, swarming around the same target. At one point, Salesforce had seven activists on its shareholder register, including Value Act, Elliott, and Third Point. First of all, how dare you leave Strive off of that list? They also considered themselves an activist. And famously, Mark Benioff laughed about it, um, so didn't even consider them serious. But I will say this. Um, it, this is sort of a good news, bad news, because if you're a company, um, this is bad. Uh, the the sort of bored, crony, you know, handshake economy is at risk. If mm. you are a company, you've traditionally done it a certain way, you're appointing your friends onto the board or people you know, known right. quantities at the worst, right? And you've mostly consolidated power with management or the CEO. This is a threat to that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is if you're a free flow analytics client, for the first time ever, you actually can measure the effectiveness of the board members using the performance metrics. It's performance attribution for board members. Uh, let's move on over to our vote results table. At Ring Central, nomination committee chair Kenneth Goldman, lead director Robert Theus, compensation committee chair Alan Tigerson, all received roughly 20% against their re-election. At the same time, co-founder CEO chair Vlad Shmunis, who controls 30% of the voting power, received only 2% votes against his re-election. So is that 20% the adjusted number? Is that the the, the Not the adjusted the number, the, the, whole, the whole number there. Which uh, means it's more than that. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's much more. Shmunis boomeranged back into his role as CEO last month after his replacement, Varek Robiati, gave up after only three months. After Robiati's disastrous stint, which saw him leaving his role at CFO at Hewlett, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, Ring Central said that Robiati's resignation was not a result of any disagreement with the company or any matter relating to the company's operations, policies, or practices. Which They're basically just saying he didn't grow up the secretary, right? That's what they're saying? Uh, what they left out was that because their ants in the pants founder's chair, former CEO, couldn't handle giving up total and complete power. That's something which that, they're that, leaving that, out. That was not in the filing, correct? Yeah. At the same time, shareholders at Ring Central also nearly voted down say on pay with 38% saying no. Their irritation might be focused on that co-founder CEO, Vlad Shmunis, who received nearly $20 million in stock despite his already considerable shareholdings. So in summary, doesn't it feel like the shareholders at RingCentral are just confused in different directions? So they're 36% voting against his pay, but but 98% voting for him to stay after he... After he Blew up uh, a, a new CEO hire by boomeranging back in after three months. Look, uh, this feels a lot like policy voting, right? Um, look at the people that got the most votes against. It was the nom chair, the lead director, the comp chair. Mm-hmm. Those are typical roles that, by policy, you vote against the comp chair if you don't like comp, but you don't vote against anybody else on the comp committee or the CEO. You, you don't never, even pay, you don't even pay do attention that. to the co-founder, the CEO, or the chair. Yeah, exactly. You don't. You never pay attention to those. The nom chair is the same. 
cool thing. Uh, who bungled the succession plan. Uh, my guess is that the diversity on this board or some other element of this board um, bothers investors, so they vote against the nom chair without recognizing the fact that this is just the CEO with a 30% of the voting power picking whoever he wants for the board, just like he picks the CEO and then kicks them out the same you know, uh, quarter. So the, 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 the confusion here is policy-based voting. I don't think it has anything to do with investors actually wanting a thing mm -hmm. or not understanding. I think it's investors just checking the box because ISS or Glass Lewis said this contravened a policy, vote this way, and that's exactly how they voted because if they thought about it, they would have voted against the, the, the an, a boomerang founder Absolutely. and they would have just voted them off the board, period. Yeah. Because we shouldn't be blowing up a CEO after three months when they found that there's no wrongdoing, there's no disagreement. So what are you voting? Why is he leaving? If there's no disagreement, right. it's not spending more time with his family. And uh, these next two stories, this same pattern holds true. At Assure Holdings, 27% of shareholders voted against Christopher Romana, Stephen Summer, and John Flood. But like at Ring Central, the CEO chair, John Farlinger, was completely spared from this negative investor sentiment. So you might be right again. They're, they're targeting because of policy, but they're completely ignoring the true leader of the board. Yeah, I think if you look at the patterns of how vote, where the negative votes are, in fact, we've looked through the historical votes, and what we see is and the, the differences are not major, right? The average vote for a director is 96% for. The average vote for chairs of committees is more like 92 or 91%. Mm -hmm. And the average vote for chairs of companies goes sometimes below 90% to 89-ish percent. The only reason why that would be the case is if you're policy voting. So same story at Eastside Drilling, where a bunch of directors received about 25% against and uh, notably spared was CEO Jeffrey Gwynn. Finally, at United States and Antimony Com Corporation, Blaze Aguirre nearly fails with 49% against his reelection. Why? Nobody seems to know. <laughs> Sorry to leave you on a question mark, no, but I, I tried. I, I just couldn't figure out why poor Blaze got 49% against. I'm, I'm happy that shareholders are doing something, but we again, we don't understand why. I mean, look, the fact is this was only there were only four members of the board up for election, right? I believe this is a classified board. Um, is this is that true? Uh, I think it's actually just a small cap. In, in which case, we're talking about four directors, mm -hmm. and you just pick one that you mm -hmm. don't like, maybe. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to the big vote. <laughs> Today's uh, focus is on Becton Dickinson Company, which has its annual meeting coming up in about two weeks' time on January 23rd. Uh, they have no shareholder proposals up for a vote this year, but we do have one that they held last year that we'll talk about a little bit later. Matt, I'll just give you the overall highlights here at Becton Dickinson, and you can weigh in. Overall... The team is hitting 401, according to our uh, uh, data. Pure mediocrity. Uh, institutionally held, Vanguard holds 9% of shares, BlackRock at 8%. No other uh, important individual shareholders. And uh, I, I, I'm struggling with Becton Dickinson. I know you were struggling, too. There's a considerable female power gap. 33% of the board is are, are women but control only 18% of influence, which is, which is notable. It's a notable gap there. And again, the only thing I, I think worth pointing out is that a share of the proposal from last year uh, put up by Kenneth Steiner uh, asking for the uh, approval of... Uh, so they wanted he wanted shareholder approval of any new severance packages for executives. He wanted that, uh, to, that sum to be less than three times the sum of a, a salary and short-term bonus. So he wanted to cap severance pay for executives, right? Yeah, just the severance pay, right? Not overall. Just the severance pay. Severance pay is, is out of control uh, at publicly traded companies. So this is yet another shareholder proposal asking for this. They usually fail. Uh, but at Becton Dickinson, this one passed quite handily. 62% supported this shareholder proposal, which I kind of find quite remarkable, honestly. But the Becton Dickinson board, with a bunch of word salad, I ha we have a CPA in office here, Jesse the Money Whisperer. Yeah. We discussed this as well. Uh, they use a bunch of weird word salad, and they basically said no. <laughs> 
Despite it passing. Despite it passing by a considerable amount. And and again, their point of view, which is often the point of view with boards who don't want to limit pay for their executives, is that it would severely limit their ability to attract and retain key talent. There's there's no proof of that, of course. I mean, look, half of this board is a CEO or chair somewhere else, right? So when you're talking about removing executive severance packages, they probably have a natural allergy to that, given that they were born Absolutely. CEOs. Absolutely. Um, I, I think the the story of Beckton Dickinson is interesting to me. Yeah, for, let's get right into it. Let's get into the election of the 11 directors. Well, this is a company that um, uh, we actually had a client a long time ago who, uh-huh. who said they ride winners that throw off high um, cash flow. Yes. And Beckton Dickinson was one of those winners. They really okay. like this company, despite the fact that they have underperformed the S&P 500 for the last five years, much less their history. They barely uh, like matched the S&P 500 for the history of the company mm-hmm. since it IPO'd. And that was in like 1974 or something like that. Um, I want to introduce a concept here. Okay. All right. This is a, we need a concept because this is a pretty boring board th- overall. Otherwise, this is a, a fairly boring yeah, board. Go but, ahead. Um, the, the concept is something that uh, Free Flow Analytics has. It's called Network Power of Directors. And okay. I, I'm going to have to walk you through it. It's going to take a second. Sure. It's going to take a hot second. We so, have a hot second. You know, have a coffee, sit back, relax, listen to this. This is the way this works. The key measurable for Free Flow Analytics is the idea of influence. We measure every director's influence on the board that they're on in the year that they're on it, right? If you take a director's influence they have on the company and you multiply it by the market cap of the company at the time, Mm -hmm. what you have is sort of, in effect, a power that director has. That director sort of has X percent of influence over a X billion dollar market cap company. They own a small bit of that market cap. You can effectively think of it that way. Okay. So we can do that at Becton Dickinson. You could take someone like Claire Frazier, who's on the board. She's 7% of the board influence at Becton. They have a $69 billion market cap. Her rough power then at globally, if you look at her from the outside, is she has control of about $4.8 billion in market cap. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot for a single person to sort of have influence over when you mm-hmm. think of it in these terms. What we do that for is that so we can rank all the directors in the entire world by effectively how much power they wield over the market. When you're on multiple boards, you can wield a lot of power. But more importantly is the idea of not just how much power an individual director has. Zuckerberg would have outsized power. Elon Musk would have sure. outsized power. Bezos would be the most powerful person in the world. Those are obvious things. What we wanted to know is how much power is in your network of friends, not just yours, but the people that you sit on boards with outside of the, just this company. Okay. So we can do the same process. We know how much power everyone has. We can do the same process by adding everyone who's in your first or second degree who sits on multiple boards and saying, here's the power of your network. Sure. And the reason why we do that, and we'll come up with- Why Beckton Dickinson? We come up with names of professional directors all of a sudden Mm -hmm. who are the most powerful directors in the world. Our top director for years was Ron Sugar, who's on the board of Uber and Chevron and a number of massive companies. And if you look at his network, he knows everybody. He has access to- Hundred more than a hundred trillion dollars. Yeah, and I will say that Beck, Beckton Dickinson has its version of Ron Sugar, naming name, a man named Bertram Scott, who is the second most powerful man on the board. He's a lead director. He's sixteen percent of influence. Matt, he sits at on the boards of Dollar Tree, Equitable Holdings, Lowe's. He previously sat on Alliance Bernstein. Uh, he's been there since two thousand two. This this guy basically is, is almost as powerful as their CEO and chair. Thomas Poland. That's exactly right. And that's the reason why I want to introduce this concept, because Becton Dickinson, all of their board members rank in the top 10% of all large cap companies for their network power. Oh, really? These are some of the most networked and powerful directors. Uh Uh-huh. On earth okay. for a large cap companies uh, and led by Bertram Scott, who you just mentioned. In fact, Scott's network is 
43 trillion dollars worth of global market cap oh. that they control. Okay. That's a trillion with a T. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's a big numbers. On average, he's connected to 30 38% of the boards that he's on, which is saying something since he's only connected to like one other board member on Becton and he's on four other boards actively now. And despite not being the CEO at any company, he averages 10% influence on all of those companies. Scott is a player. Yeah. He is powerful, he has powerful friends. Absolutely. He has a lot of influence at the company that he sits on. At Dollar Tree, he has 100% connected to the board. Every member of the board, he knows either from another board or from uh, a friend. I will say that this is especially important at Beckton Dickinson because they have a mandatory retirement policy that it, that works. Marshall Larson stepped down is stepping down this year, 75 years old. Bertram Scott is 72. He's going to be gone from the board soon, which means... All of this power is going to be consolidated with one man, and that's the CEO and chair, Thomas Poland. So I think it's important to know what's coming when Bertram Scott leaves this board. So that brings me to my recommendation. Yeah, let's go right to it. The, Your the recommendation. What here. do you think? Um, I look through every single board member. There's not a lot to say about most of them. There's, there, I there, agree. You could vote against some. You could make cases sure. against others. Some of them, you know, underperform, uh, you know, the global directors, they, their TSR, their earnings. All pretty average, though. They're, but everybody's basically in this average zone. Mm -hmm. What I think is actually interesting here is Scott is powerful and he's the lead director at this company, where the CEO actually has no first or second degree board connections to this board, despite also being chair. This board is an aristocratic board. It's run by smart people and CEOs and ex-CEOs. But they do not seem beholden to the current CEO, unlike the CEO who stepped down in 2019 for Lenza, the prior CEO okay. and chair. He'd been at the company for 40 years. He was he handpicks this board. Right. right? So, and he is off the board currently. And he's off the board right. currently, which means – Pollen's a little bit of a lame duck here. Not so much lame as he has less power than you'd expect for a company, for a person in his position at this right. company. Chair CEO separation is not on the ballot. So voting out, um, uh, my suggestion would be what you need is a board run company at a, at a company where uh, the one of the highest stockholders is actually Scott. He has 25,000 shares, which mm -hmm. is um, more than any other board member. Right. Um, well, he's been there since 2002. He's been there for a long time. He has a vested interest in this company going well. Mm -hmm. um, the chair CEO roles are not separated. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that this CEO, who has delivered subpar stock performance, earnings, basically across the board, they've been par to subpar. Yeah. He's also, he's, it's funny you mentioned that because he also sits on a board that we refer to constantly as subpar, which we covered recently on the show, which is Walgreens. Yes, where he basically has no power because Stefano Piscina runs that board. We talked about this in, uh, but on it's a, the show. But it's a board that's consi that is co constantly been struggling uh, uh, with earnings and TSR. I'm guessing yeah. that Pollen is effectively a, 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 a weak, thin ice CEO, and mm -hmm. Scott is the most powerful counterbalance to him. My suggestion, All right. you vote for everybody, including Bertram Scott, okay. and you vote against Pollen. You can't separate CEO chair. It's not on the slate. But this could be the company where you test the theory, what happens when you remove the CEO from the board and turn the board into professionals doing the professional work of representing their shareholders, right. particularly when one or two of the directors have significant shareholdings in mm -hmm. the company, not because they bought them, but because they have a vested interest and they're sitting on those options. So um, my rec here for the board slate is for everyone against CEO Pollen. That's right. It. And remember, this doesn't remove Pollen from the CEO role. It just removes him from his board role. Exactly. And, which might be also important for a board like this, because as I mentioned, Bertram Scott will be stepping down soon. So this might also add to the succession planning of future board power. I think that's correct. All right. So that's the uh, that's the election of directors over there, Beckton Dickinson. The, there's also an auditor and a stay on pay vote. I, you know, look, I, I don't know there's much here to say as well. Uh Shareholders supported say on pay 93% last year. Um, I could give you a few highlights. The CEO pay ratio is certainly quite high, 408 to 1. Uh, they One thing that they have that always irks me is that they have a TSR modifier. You're talking about TSR. So if they are, if their performance is at equal or less than 25th percentile uh, compared to their peers, it only modifies their pay by, uh, to a factor of 
AX. So it only, it's only a 20% ding, even if they're at the bottom, the worst TSR performer in with their peers. It basically does not affect their bonus. So I don't understand, and this is a, a more like a philosophical uh, problem I have, but there's so much emphasis right now on um, DEI diversity mm -hmm. and how it factors into compensation from, from a ESG view, factors. Yes. Um, there's a lot of conversation about it and how it's like distorting pay, which it absolutely 100% is not doing yeah. that. We know that. Of course. And yet the most basic thing, like you are in the worst quartile of the entire market yeah. of your peers. Not only worst quartile, Matt, Beckton Dixon takes, takes it a step further. You can actually be last. You could be dead last. I mean, like, like extrapolate those numbers and say that this is um, a, a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. and let's say that you are, you know, Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. This is like saying, Steph Curry, we will give you $20 million, but for your bonus, for or, or we'll give you $5 million for your bonus. We're, if you perform like a bench player the in worst, the G League, if you're the worst player at your position. We will give you only eighty percent of, of, of what we yeah. agreed. It's to. exactly the same. Yeah. It, it, that is bananas. Yeah. The, I don't know why investors allow these modifiers to exist at anything less than zero. You get zero if you're in the bottom quartile. Isn't that performance alignment? Yeah, I tell you, I don't think investors spend the time they should in these compensation discussion analysis sections, and and I think that the not only do the companies know that, but they also sort of make them intentionally hard to understand. They also select their own peer groups, right? So right. if you track peer groups from year to year, there mm -hmm. are rules about how they have to select the peer groups, but they're loose rules and they're vague rules. And it generally is somebody else has to select it for you. But if you're paying a consultant to select your peer group, you're paying the consultant to select your peer group. That's like there's an immediate conflict. Yeah. There's so many ways you can juice this. You just need to make the stat. If you are in the bottom quartile for TSR, you get zero. You get zero extra dollars. That That is how you should play this. Of course. So you got to vote on say on pay with all so that said? So my vote on say on pay here is no. I think actually in this show, um, we are. it's going to be hard to differentiate because a lot of the say on pay just feels like no. It just feels like no one reads the details and we just say yes, and that's a problem. That's it. That's Beckton Dickinson. They don't have anything else. No shareholder proposals this year uh, after after shareholders supported one last year. I don't know. They, they, this is, seems like to be the company to target. So maybe next year we can get some more up for a vote. Uh, that's the proxy countdown for the week of January 8th, uh, 2024. Join us next week when we jump back into the alternative democracy pool forever on the lookout for shareholder sharks, floating band-aids, and wayward directors. Does there have to be band-aids involved? <laughs> <laughs>